from New York uh, today to be with us. Uh, we've got Michael Pratt, and he is software engineer from Google. And he's going to tell us, what are you going to tell us about, Michael? About profile-guided optimization. Very good, guys. I, I shall leave you to it. Enjoy. Right. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for introducing me. Uh, my name is Michael Pratt. Uh, as he said, I'm a software engineer uh, on the Go team at Google. Uh, and I'm going to talk today a bit about profile-guided optimization, which is a new Go toolchain feature uh, that we built in collaboration with several engineers from Uber uh, and released last year in Go 1.21. And uh, the, the goal of profile-guided op optimization is to help you improve the performance of your Go applications. So let's dive in. Uh, so profile-guided optimization, or, or just PGO, is a category of compiler optimization techniques supported by compilers in a variety of different languages. Uh, with PGO, the compiler uses information about the runtime behavior of a program in order to improve the optimization decisions made by the compiler. Uh, now, you may have also heard the term uh, feedback-directed optimization, or FDO. Uh, FDO and PGO are just interchangeable terms for the exact same concepts. Uh, but before we talk about uh, profile-guided optimizations, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we mean by just compiler optimizations in general. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, we'll, I'll spend a, a moment to talk about exactly what we mean by a compiler. So in the most general sense, a compiler is a program that translates source code from one language into another target language. Uh, with Go, we're generally talking about the Go compiler that you use uh, with Go build. And the Go compiler translates Go source code into machine code for your target CPU. So AMD64, ARM64, something like that. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with reading assembly, don't worry, I'm going to keep it light in this talk, not too much. So on the left here, uh, we have a trivial addition function in Go. And on the right, we can see the resulting assembly code for AMD64. So if this has an add queue instruction, which is going to add the value of two registers together, and a ret instruction that's going to return to the caller. And this is about as simple as a compiled function can get. Uh, so let's see a little bit more by putting it into context. So now we have a call to the add function from our main function. And in the assembly output on the right, we can see some, the arguments one and two are moved into some registers. There's a call instruction to take us to the add function. And then when the add function returns, there's another move instruction to move the result into the destination for C. All right, so the output we saw uh, showcases a sort of central design decision of most mainstream compilers, uh, including Go, which is that functions are sort of the core unit of compilation. So just as we use functions in our source code to organize our code within a package, the compiler is also going to use functions to segment its compilation steps. So each function will be compiled independently of one another and generate its own little block of assembly like we saw on the previous slide. And calls between functions are handled with CPU call instructions to jump in between the different functions. And a compiler will also define some sort of a calling convention, which is just a, a standardized format for how we pass arguments uh, and return values back and forth, just to make sure that the different functions can, can communicate. Um, but it's worth uh, sort of stepping back for a moment and wondering why compilers do things this way. You know, you could imagine, alternatively, maybe a compiler would start with main and just start generating assembly, and then when there's a function call, take the code from that function and stuff it into the same assembly output and sort of generate one giant blob of assembly for the entire program. And there's a few reasons why compilers uh, don't usually do that. Uh, first of all, uh, in many cases, it's actually not feasible to do that. Uh, you can imagine, say, an interface call to like an io.writer. Uh, when the compiler is compiling that call, it doesn't know if it's going to be an os.file or some other type that you're actually calling to. So there's going to need to be some sort of dynamic jump at runtime to go to the right code, depending on what it is at runtime. Uh, secondly, even if it is uh, feasible, generating one big blob uh, of assembly could really significantly bloat your binary size. Uh, 
If you think about having a function that's maybe called in a thousand different places in your program, uh, if we took that approach, we would need to duplicate that code a thousand times and really uh, make the binaries quite a bit larger. And that can be uh, a Annoying for deployment to have a giant binary, but it's also actually bad for performance because the CPU needs to read instructions from memory and the, the, the more code it has to read can have at least a slight impact uh, on, on your application performance. Um, and finally, uh, mini compiler uh, optimizations are actually quite complex or even uh, NP complete. And so compilers often utilize heuristics to sort of maintain fast compilation time and still achieve pretty good results. And as the, the code size that the optimization needs to target increases, those algorithms can either slow down compilation or the heuristics we came up with may sort of start to fall apart and generate suboptimal code. So by keeping the code size relatively small, by keeping it encapsulated in individual functions, can sort of help manage that complexity. Uh, and so as a result of this separation, most compiler optimizations only apply to a single function, not to the entire program. All right, so let's take a look at our first compiler optimization, which is inlining. And inlining is more or less sort of the exception to the, the, the separate function uh, compilation rule, where in certain cases the compiler will decide that it actually is worthwhile to directly include the body of a called function into its caller. So here's an example uh, with inlining the call to add into main. And on the right, we can see sort of an example of what this inlining looks like. So the arguments to the add function were placed in some local variables. And then the C value is now computed directly for, by adding A and B rather than having to call a function. And we can sort of notice an interesting opportunity here, and now that we've done this inlining, which is just by looking at this code in main, we can see that the value of C is always going to be three. And we'd really like the compiler to, to be able to figure this same thing out. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, most optimizations op operate within a single function. So now that we've inlined uh, add into main, we can potentially unlock optimizations that weren't possible before. So let's see what the compiler can do. So constant propagation is a compiler optimization that replaces values that are known to be constant with the constants themselves. So here, A and B have constant values. So constant propagation will replace their uses, uh, simplifying the program. And now we have C equals one plus two. And the compiler could at this point emit an add instruction to add one plus two. Uh, but we know that the result of that addition is going to be the same every single time. So instead, the compiler can itself evaluate the expression and replace the entire expression with its result, which is called constant folding. So here's the final assembly code uh, before and after all of the optimizations, which is quite an improvement. Uh, on the left, we started with the setup for a call, we performed an addition, we removed uh, the result into its destination, and on the right, we're left with simply moving the result directly into the destination with no call and no computation whatsoever. Now, of course, this is a pretty contrived example. Uh, real world code is unlikely to be quite this straightforward and probably won't have this extreme of a simplification. Uh, but inlining still often has opportunities to reduce computation. It can potentially uh, remove if conditions that it can prove are always false or do additional optimizations on constants like this. And a single inline site is probably not going to make a huge difference to the performance of an application, but these small improvements can add up if we start doing them in thousands of different places within a program. Okay, uh, let's talk about another optimization in the Go compiler related to heap allocations. Um, so just as a reminder, if you're not aware, there's two places that memory for objects can be allocated in Go, either on the heap or on the stack. Uh, the heap is a fully general purpose memory allocation. Any object can be allocated on the heap and the garbage collector will determine when the object is no longer used and free its memory. Uh, on the other hand, the stack is a single chunk of memory allocated for a Go routine and each Go routine gets its own stack. Stack memory is managed during function call and return. 
So each function will use a fixed amount of stack space. Uh, and whenever that function is called, the stack size will increase to accommodate the space required. And when it returns, the stack size will decrease, effectively freeing all the objects uh, in that part of the stack. So we can see an example of how this works on the right. The stack starts off empty. And when foo is called, uh, it needs space to store the variable a. So the stack size is increased, and we use one slot to store the value of a. Then foo calls bar, and it uh, increases the stack size further to store the values of b and c. <coughs> then when bar returns, b and c are no longer required. So the stack size decreases, and we free up that space. And now, finally, the second call to bar does the same as the first call, allocates space for the b and c values. But notice that we've reused the same part of the stack as the previous call. And this is very fast reuse of memory uh, once, the once it was freed by the previous function return. But also notice that the stack has limitations. Because the memory is freed on function return, we must never place something on the stack if it can be referenced after the function returns. So we can only use it for local values, which we'll see an example of in a moment. But if the stack has these limitations, why would we use it at all? Why don't we just put everything on the heap? And the reality is that while Go tries to make heap memory management as fast as we can, stack management is pretty much the fastest possible memory allocator. Allocating on the stack is little more than an addition and a subtraction during function entry and exit. On the other hand, heap allocation requires uh, looking up free space and more complex data structures during allocation and a garbage collector to notice that the object is no longer referenced and then free its memory. So as a result, it's almost always preferable to allocate objects on the stack if possible. All right, let's look at another example to showcase how the compiler decides what to allocate on the stack. This process is called escape analysis because the compiler is trying to decide whether references or pointers to an object uh, remain within the function or if they escape beyond the function return. So in this first function, we create a new foo object, and then we return a pointer to the object. This is clearly escaping the function. If this object were to be placed on the stack, it would be freed when new foo returns, and the callers would immediately have an invalid pointer. Uh, instead, we have to place this object on the heap, and the garbage collector will determine when it's safe to free the object. In the second function, we still create a foo object and get a pointer to it, just as before. However, uh, unlike before, the uses of this pointer are all contained within the function. So by the time the function returns, f is no longer used, so it's safe to place this object on the stack. That said, as Go developers, we've probably seen hundreds of functions like this new foo function, uh, and we probably wouldn't write compute this way. Uh, instead, we would use the provided new foo function to allocate the foo object for us, to, to initialize the foo object for us. Uh, but this is unfortunate for performance, since the allocation has now moved from the compute function into the new foo function, which, as we determined before, can't safely allocate it on the stack and must allocate the object on the heap, which is unfortunate because it's going to slow down our code. But this is where inlining comes in again to help, help us out. If the compiler inlines the call to new foo into compute, then we can once again safely allocate the object on the stack and eliminate the heap allocation. And since al stack allocation is so much faster than heap allocation, eliminating heap allocations is actually one of the most impactful downstream effects that inlining can have uh, on performance of an application. OK, so we've seen a couple different ways that compiler optimizations can help improve our code. And I mentioned earlier that compiler optimizations uh, tend to utilize heuristics to make decisions eff effectively. And function inlining is no different. Um, re recall from the downsides earlier that downsides to inlining are largely related to code size. We don't want to make the overall binary too big, and we don't want to slow down the compiler by giving it too much code to optimize. Uh, and therefore, the primary heuristics in the Go compiler for inlining are related to code size. So the Go compiler will consider small functions safe to inline and large functions not safe to inline. Um, but this is pretty conservative. 
And it probably res results in missing some, some optimization opportunities that we could otherwise have. A uh, more powerful thing that we could notice here is that we really only care about the performance of hot functions, which are functions that execute often. If you think about it this way, if a compiler optimization makes some function twice as fast, but that function is never called, then it has no impact on the performance of the application whatsoever. And it turns out that in the vast majority of programs, only a small percentage of functions use the vast majority of CPU time. So I, I, I took the, the Go compiler itself as a sort of example uh, large Go application. And it turns out in the Go compiler, only 15% of the functions in the binary are responsible for more than 99% of all the CPU time uh, that is used. And it only takes 4% of the functions to use more than 90% of all the CPU time. And this pattern is common across most programs. Uh, often our programs include code that is maybe only used once during initialization, or it's only used uh, with flags or configuration options that we don't actually set in production. Or the code is reachable any time, but it really only happens in very rare conditions. And so it, it's just not uh, called that often. So if we can limit our, uh, our inlining optimizations to target only the hottest code, then we'll be targeting code with the highest potential impact and we'll limit the code size bloat risk that we're worried about. Uh, however, unfortunately, a compiler only gets the source code to the program as input. So how is it going to know which functions are hot? And this sort of brings us back full circle. We want to know which functions are hot, which is exactly what a CPU profile would tell us. If we can provide that profile to the compiler, then it could use that information to guide optimization decisions, and we'd have profile-guided optimization. Uh, inlining, it turns out, is one of the primary decisions that PGO informs in Go today. The Go compiler will use the pro profile to determine which functions are hottest, and it will focus its inlining efforts on those. So now let's see how this works in action with an example application. Uh, I'm going to use uh, just a simple HTTP server for this example. Uh, since we're talking about PGO, I created a server that analyzes a Go profile and then reports the hottest functions in this profile. Now, I've, I've skipped a lot of the code here for space. There's just a, a couple things to note. Uh, first of all, this is just a standard net HTTP server that we've all seen a thousand of. In the request handler, it's going to read the request body, parse it as a pprof profile, do a little bit of, a, bit of processing to group the data by function, and then respond with the five hottest functions that it finds. Uh, second thing to note is this pprof package that we're using. Uh, if you're familiar with profiling in Go, uh, then you have probably used Go tool pprof to explore some of that profiling data. And this package is from the same tool and allows parsing profiles uh, within your own applications, which can be super helpful if you're looking to do some sort of analysis that the existing tooling doesn't directly support. So it's definitely something I recommend checking out if you're, you're really trying to analyze uh, profiles uh, beyond what the tooling can do. And finally, I'll just note this uh, net HTTP pprof import. This is one of the easiest ways to add profiling to a web server. Uh, simply importing this package will add HTTP endpoints to the default uh, MUX handler that will, are able to collect profiles and we'll use this uh, in a moment. So here's a quick peek at what this server does. When I upload a profile uh, that I collected from this server uh, earlier, we can see that the top functions in this, this application happen to be a couple from the Go runtime, uh, one from the, that pprof package, and a couple doing uh, some decompression. All right, so now let's collect a few profiles of our own. Uh, now, the goal of PGO is to provide the compiler with more information about how the application behaves in its production environment. So we really recommend collecting profiles from your real production environment if you possibly can. Now, my toy server doesn't have a real production environment, uh, so I've written a small load testing tool to put it under load. And while the server is loaded, I can fetch a profile from this uh, debug pprof profile endpoint, which was added by that import I mentioned earlier, and it will collect a profile for 30 seconds. Now, while it's not required in order to use uh, PGO, 
I'll take a moment to uh, look at our profile just to get a sense of where this program is spending its time. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Go ships with a PPROF tool for analyzing profiles. This tool has a command line and a web UI, both of which can visualize profiles in uh, numerous different ways. Um, one of the most generally useful visualizations uh, in this UI is the flame graph view. Uh, you may have seen this earlier today if you went to Brian's talk uh, on, on uh, optimization. And this type of visualization it was originally created by Brendan Gregg for Linux uh, perf tooling, um, but is now commonly used in tooling in many different languages. Uh, here's a, a quick overview uh, if, you're not, if you've never seen a flame graph before. So each box on the screen is a stack frame with callers above callees. The text is a little bit small to see here, but uh, in the upper left we can see there's a serve method calling a serve HTTP method, calling two more serve HTTP methods, and finally this upload post function, function which is the one that I had on the screen uh, a few moments ago. And the width of the boxes here represents the portion of total, proportion of total CPU time that was spent in this function or its callees. So the wider the box, the more time that was spent. And we can t take a few quick high level takeaways uh, from this view. So first of all, we can see that about 80% of the CPU time is spent in that HTTP handler. Uh, the portions in the runtime on the right, I happen to know are mostly from the Go garbage collector. So if I were really wanting to dive deep into to looking at performance improvements, I may want to investigate why, why we're spending time in the GC. Um, within our handler itself, we can see about half the time is spent parsing the input. Uh, this time on the left here, it's split between gzip decompression and protobuf on marshalling. Uh, this seems mostly unavoidable since our input is, is a profile, but maybe there's some way that it, it, it could go faster. And most of the uh, time, remaining time on the, the right half is spent on processing that I added to the function in order to determine the hottest functions from the profile data. And this would be a great place to investigate if all of this work is really necessary. Uh, it's quite possible I may be doing more work than strictly necessary here. Um, so together, this gives us a sort of high level view uh, and a, a good starting point if we were going to manually optimize this application. Um, but I'm not going, we're not here to be manually optimizing the application. If you are interested in that, uh, Brian gave a great talk this morning. Uh, if you missed that, I recommend uh, finding the, the recording online. Uh, what we want to see is what can the compiler do with this profile. So recall that we just used a quick curl command to collect the profile. And once we collect it, if we rename this profile to default.pgo and place it in the same directory as our package main, then go build will automatically detect this file and use it as the profile uh, during compilation. Um, we recommend keeping your profiles uh, right alongside your source code in your repository, which helps ensure that anyone, can, anyone that fetches your code can reproduce the exact same build because they'll, they'll always have the, the same profile you had. Uh, but if that's not possible for some reason, it's also pa possible to explicitly pass a path to the profile with the dash PGO flag. So once after uh, I built with PGO, I measured a couple different uh, CPU and latency metrics on both the original uh, server and the PGO optimized server, which I'm comparing here with the BenchStat tool. And what we can see is about a 10% improvement across all of these metrics. Um, I would say that's pretty great considering that we just ran a couple different commands and gave the compiler a little bit more information. Um, PGO is optimizing uh, a lot of the, the low-level details, like thing, things like inlining. So the high-level high observations I made when looking at the flame graph uh, probably still apply if I wanted to go try to optimize uh, this application even more. Um, I, I will note that the, the effect of PGO can definitely vary on applications. Uh, the best applications we've seen get about 15% uh, improvement in CPU time, but some applications aren't affected as much and maybe only get 2% improvements. The effect can be kind of difficult to predict since it depends on how sensitive uh, the, the application is to, to, um, to optimizations like inlining, but luckily it's pretty easy to try out and sort of see how your application is impacted. Uh, it's also worth noting that 
the, the effects of PGO are generally on CPU time. So if your application is not particularly CPU bound, maybe it's spending lots of time waiting for a database response, then you may still see a drop in CPU time, but your request latency is maybe not that impacted because the CPU uh, overhead just really wasn't impacting latency that much. So it really depends on the application. Um, and as the Go compiler continues to improve, um, we expect the compiler to sort of make more and more use of this data now that we have it in the compiler uh, in new optimizations and, and new improvements. Um, so if we take another look at a profile of our PGO optimized server, we can get a quick look under the hood to get a sense of what has changed. So here I'm using the PPOF tool again, this time just with the command line, performing a diff uh, profile to compare the profile from before we use PGO to a profile of the server after PGO. And what we can see here in the middle is about uh, an overall 10% uh, CPU time drop, which is the same as what we were seeing in our benchmarks, so that's a good verification. And on the left, we can see the magnitude of change in the CPU time in individual functions. So we can see that there's a bunch of improvements in the runtime package. Uh, there's also some improvements in that PPROF package dependency that we're using. And one of the exciting aspects of PGO is that because the profile covers your entire application, including the code you wrote and your dependencies and the Go standard library, PGO also applies to all of those. So you may get improvements in code that you've never even seen before. I mean, you can notice here that my actual package main code doesn't even appear in this improvement. All the improvements came from the dependencies, or at least the top 10 of them did. Uh, you may also notice that the fourth function here, uh, that runtime internal atomic one, actually has a regression. It's using more CPU time. Um, these sorts of individual regressions are to be expected. At the end of the day, a compiler is using heuristics. It can't really be certain that anything it does is an improvement. Uh, so the important aspect here is that in aggregate, the improvements outweigh the regressions, which is certainly the case here. All right, so we've seen uh, pretty good results when running this server locally. So now let's take a look at the same server with a cloud deployment. Uh, in this case, I'm going to deploy it to Google Cloud Run, just because it, it's easy for me to scale up with my load test. But the concepts here are, are similar in, in most cloud environments. Uh, so here, I'm uh, deploying the application, and at the end, it spits out the URL that I, I'm going to use to apply some load. Um, now, Google uh, Cloud Run happens to work uh, with Google Cloud Profiler, which is a continuous profiling service that collects profiles from a, across a fleet of instances. So while before I manually downloaded a profile from that debug endpoint that we saw, a continuous profiling service is sort of periodically going to uh, random instances in, in our fleet in, in the cloud and collecting profiles from them and sort of aggregating them and letting me view the data. And a lot of different continuous profiling services uh, exist and, and, and can provide sort of similar functionality. And in my opinion, a continuous profiling is invaluable for visibility into the performance characteristics of your application. You can use these services for things like detecting regressions when your, your application, a new deployment is suddenly using uh, more resources. They can also be used as a jumping off point to sort of investigate the kinds of uh, things that I saw in the previous flame graph where maybe you could manually optimize the application. Um, in our case, they're also useful for, for providing the production profile that we need for PGO. So here, I'm going to just click the, the manual down, download button to download the profile. Uh, but you could also imagine uh, building some sort of workflow that would periodically fetch new profiles uh, to integrate into your build. So with the, the production profile downloaded, I can uh, install it in my package main with, as default.pgo, and then build and redeploy the application. Now, with PGO deployed, we could, of course, run the same benchmarks I ran again and, and look for similar improvements. Uh, but now that we have a production deployment, we can also see some, some more additional interesting metrics. And I think the most interesting one here is the billable container instance time. Uh, in Cloud Run, this is the main thing that you're paying for. This is the CPU time of, uh, of your container instances 
and it's billed per, per CPU second. So we can see here as the deployment rolls out, Cloud Run happens to run both simultaneously, so there's a little increase. Uh, but once the deployment completes, we see about a 10% drop in total billable time. Um, now, this is pretty great because this, this metric is not just less CPU time, but it's also literally less money that we're spending uh, to, to run this service. All right, so we've seen some nice results from PGO. Uh, now I'm just going to step through a couple of um, best practices or good things to know to make the most use of PGO uh, in, in your application. Um, first and foremost, I know I mentioned this before, but please uh, collect profiles for PGO from your production environment if you possibly can. Now you may have some benchmarks uh, in your source code along with your tests. It's definitely easy and tempting to simply profile those benchmarks and use that to build with PGO. But the whole purpose of PGO is to inform the compiler how the application is going to behave in its production environment. And these benchmarks can be, often be surprisingly different from the production environment. Uh, micro benchmarks in particular, which might be alongside your Go tests, often exercise only a very small portion of the application. And on the other hand, a profile from your production is by definition representative of production. Um, now, that said, if you really can't collect profiles from production for some reason, uh, or maybe you're a command line tool and there is no production, uh, and you have to use a synthetic, some sort of synthetic benchmark source for a profile, not all is lost. You may not have a perfect representative benchmark, uh, but we, we did try to design PGO so that if there's a poor match between uh, your profile and the actual production behavior, uh, the, the optimizations in PGO are intended to be fail-safe, which is to say, if you have a bad profile, you might not see much improvement from that profile, but you also shouldn't see regressions from the profile. Uh, we, we really try not to make the application slower, even if the profile is a mismatch. Uh, next is that we say that uh, Go's PGO is source-stable. Um, and to explain what this means, Imagine that you have a production application that you deploy, say, once per week. So you deploy a version this week, and you collect a profile, and you're going to use that profile for next week's build for PGO. Uh, but this application, it's still under active development. So when you deploy next week, the addition of a, a profile for PGO isn't going to be the only change to the application. Developers on the team have made a variety of changes to the application, and so different parts of the source may be different. Now, this means that you're a profile isn't going to be a perfect match to the source code that you're building anymore. For instance, some function that appears in the profile may have been completely deleted and not even exists in the source anymore. And this sort of shift in the source of the application between collecting the profile and using it for a build is totally fine in, for, for Go's PGO. And we say it's source stable because it can withstand these kinds of small differences in source code. And now it's true that, that functions that have changed since we collected the profile were certainly less likely to be able to apply uh, PGO optimizations to. But as we saw earlier, improvements often show up in our dependencies or the standard library. So the reality is that from deploy to deploy, only a very small fraction of the program is usually changing. So what that means is we will probably get... Um, a slow degradation in the quality of the match and like how much performance improvement we can get with PGO over time as the application sort of drifts. So you do want to keep your profiles reasonably up to date, but it's not something that we really need to stress over. And finally, we have iterative stability. Um, so here on the slide, I've got what a sort of <laughs> typical PGO lifestyle might look, uh, life cycle might look like. So first, before we ever enable PGO. We've built and released our application without PGO. Uh, then we're going to collect some profiles from the production. And then we're going to build and release again, now using the PGO profile. And this sort of continues in a loop. So now we're going to keep collecting new profiles from production and use them for our, our, our later builds. And this sort of cycle just keeps going forever. And the key thing to note here is that after our initial deployment, we're always running with a PGO-enabled binary in production. Um, 
So we're collecting from a, a pro, we're profiling an already PGO optimized binary. Now in some, some PGO type systems, this isn't, this, this won't work because in some systems you need to either profile a specially instrumented binary or the PGO optimizations may interfere with the data in the profiles and sort of confuse the compiler. Now luckily these aren't problems for Go's PGO. It's totally fine to collect profiles regardless of the number of iterations of PGO that the build has gone through. Um, this, is, this is actually a really nice property since it simplifies updates. You, can just, you don't need to deploy a special version or an unop unoptimized build. Uh, you can simply continuously use PGO and continue to collect uh, new, new profiles for PGO. All right. That brings us towards the end. Uh, so we took a look at several different uh, optimizations around inlining, constant propagation, uh, escape analysis, and how they can improve the generated code, and how a profile can help the compiler make a, a, an even better decision uh, in, this, in the build of the application. And then we, we saw PGO in action with a, a local application and deploying it to the cloud and a couple tips and tricks uh, for using PGO. So I definitely hope you will give PGO a, a try in your application, see how much improvement, performance improvement you can get, uh, and hopefully um, keep it enabled and, and deployed. And I, I do want to give a shout out uh, to a bunch of people that helped build PGO for Go. Uh, it takes a lot of people to add new functionality to Go, um, and in particular, uh, Raj, Jin, Chris, Cherry, and Austin put in a ton of work to make PGO a reality. Uh, Uber in particular has been interested in PGO for Go for a long time and has been collaborating uh, with the Go team at Google to sort of make this a reality. Uh, Raj and Jin actually contributed the initial imp implementation to the compiler, and Jin and Chris have continued contributing uh, new PGO-based optimizations to, to build on the impact we can have. And Uber has actually rolled out P, uh, PGO to their applications fleet-wide uh, and gotten a really nice reduction in CPU utilization across lots of their services. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about Go's PGO, Jen actually gave a talk at GopherCon in Chicago last month. I don't think the recording is on YouTube yet, but uh, whenever it does, I definitely suggest checking it out. All right, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions if you have any. Um, please uh, give PGO a try. If you have any questions or feedback, I'll be around this whole conference. I'd love to talk. Um, on the bottom here is the link to the PGO reference documentation. And since I haven't heard anyone uh, say it so far, I want to give a shout out to Go 1.23, which was just released this week. Uh, it's got iterators, fun new features to try out. It also has improvements to make um, builds for PGO faster uh, so you don't get as much overhead. Or, or there's significantly less slowdown to compilation time from a PGO build. So thanks so much. <laughs> Any, oh. Do we have mics? Uh, thanks. That was a really amazing talk. Uh, really interesting. Um, I just have a question. Uh, you, you're talking about optimizations to begin with. Um, can you give an example at Google where you found the most impact when using the uh, when trying to optimize and put stuff onto uh, onto the stack there? Uh, the question is, like, which optimizations have the most impact? Yeah, one perhaps real world example that you found that has the most impact um, in general, really. In general, I would say uh, impact from escape analysis is usually the biggest. That is, uh, when the compiler can determine to move allocations from the heap to the stack. Um, and, and I had an example of that on here just because uh, allocations in the hot path can generate a lot of garbage and can, can really uh, burn through CPU time, both during the allocation and in GC time. And when they, those allocations move to the stack, they effectively become free. And so we can see, we, we've 
we've seen a lot of big wins from improving escape analysis or just making sure that, that um, things that are, are possible to put on the stack do actually get put on the stack. Thank you. Hello. Um, you mentioned that you could aggregate the profiles on the cloud. Is that generally available in the tooling? Uh, you mean uh, to use in local tooling? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is possible in the uh, GoTool PPROF has, uh, it actually if you, uh, the slide is gone, but if you go to the reference documentation, it has an example uh, command to, to merge multiple profiles. It's not, the easiest to use because th there's a couple caveats with like the profiles need to be sort of collected of the same length. Um, but you can do it with that tooling or you have a little bit more control. Uh, if you use the, the package on the screen there I showed can also help you um, uh, do sort of custom sorts of aggregation that you might need. Cool. Thank you. A really great talk. Thanks so much. So one question I had is because we're collecting traces from our production environment, is there any risk that if you only did this once and you didn't follow your iteration cycle, could you get a non-typical trace and therefore could the profile guided optimization ever be worse than if you were not using it? Uh, the, so I think you, you if you if I understood correctly, your question is, could you get an actual regression in the overall application uh, versus not having a profile at all? Yeah. So I imagine if you do this iteratively, mm -hmm. you're always eventually going to capture traces that are typical of your production workload, mm -hmm. right? But if you only did this once, maybe to experiment with it, and that 30-second trace happened to be more atypical, mm -hmm. could that lead to potentially the wrong heuristics being applied and therefore actually being worse sure. than a non-guided uh, optimization? Uh, so it's generally our goal that that would not... Um, cause any performance regressions. Uh, we, we explicitly avoid uh, doing things like de-optimizing, like saying like, oh, this function looks cold, so we're going to not inline it. We explicitly avoid that to help cover cases like this where the profile maybe wasn't a perfect match. Uh, so generally, uh, you, you shouldn't see regressions. You might not see improvement. Um, now, there's always chances for edge cases or bugs or things like that, but, but that's sort of the goal. But basically, there's no reason not to do this. Right. Cool. Thank you. Hey, um, you mentioned that PGOs weren't a kind of new concept generally and they've been implemented for other compilers. Um, any lessons learned from other reference implementations? Uh, one of uh, the big, a couple of the biggest things we learned from, from other implementations are the, that source stability and iterative stability uh, concepts are, they're important to make this easy to use. That, that was one of our big goals going into this is we want PGO to be as easy to use as possible. In fact, in other languages, PGO can tend to have a kind of bad rap for being very difficult uh, and sort of fiddly to use. Um, so that was one of the things that we kind of uh, focused on. And th there's actually a paper um, from a team at, at, at Google called AutoFDO from several years ago on their findings about doing uh, similar types of PGO in C++ um, that covers those concepts and, and has been super helpful. Awesome. Thanks. Any more for any more? Is that us? Michael Pratt, you've been a complete star. Thank you to Michael for coming from New York. Thank you. Thank you.